Now we're going to come to gender differences and neurodevelopment as a whole, because it's really important when we have this foundation, when we apply the diagnostic hierarchy, things will become uh, easier. So firstly, 80% of the brain reaches adult size by age two. And of course, we know about synaptic pruning, basically during puberty, it's more about synaptic pruning and enhancing those specific synapses. And this is when neurodevelopmental abnormalities can occur. But this is the fascinating case. This was the case that has been published, the boy with no brain. And as you can see, this is at birth on the left-hand side. This was in exactly at age two. 80% uh, of the brain had grown by age two. Now, gender differences, really important. Males have a very different phenotype, even from an EEG perspective. So what you see here is it's known as a developmental deviation model. And here, what you find is that the maturation is not necessarily lagging. But, it's, but that it is not approaching normality or maturation and that it is unlikely to do so at any stage during the lifespan. Now this is of course for um, males with quite significant ADHD type phenotype. But what I wanna highlight here is this widespread theta activity. It's widespread. They use a marker for improvement known as frontal theta. So when there is adequate frontal theta, which is nothing but frontal top-down inhibition. You see here, theta widespread. Uh, theta is four to seven hertz, correct? Just above the delta slow waves. When there is adequate frontal theta, it's a marker of good top-down inhibition. And that's exactly what they're measuring in that Endeavor treatment. So that's for males, the developmental deviation. Females, on the other hand, it's really interesting, is they show greater involvement of central and autonomic function. This is so, so important in clinical practice because many, many females will have diagnosis of anxiety, arousal, borderline personality through their impulse discontrol, emotional arousal, heightened emotional sensitivity, heightened rejection sensitivity. You will see diagnosis very commonly of bipolar 2. Now note, it doesn't mean we're not looking at, hey, do they have bipolar 2 or do they not? We can make a difference to their prefrontal cortex functioning and em emotional regulation through appropriate targeting. But very commonly, I find that bipolar 2 diagnoses are there and the patient's having a number of residual symptoms. One of the clues that often tells me that I need to go a bit deeper into this reward deficit cognition activity is that they're often on a very small dose of an um, antipsychotic medication. I examine them and they're having cogwheeling. Or when they're talking about cognition, they're talking about significant slowing out of proportion to what I would normally see. I'll do a Luria three-step and I see significant slowing, right? So it's out of proportion. And remember I mentioned when they've got a reward deficit state D2 and you add a D2 antagonist, they have an exaggerated side effect profile than others. So this is one of the places where it, the red flags that tells me, hey, I need to go a bit deeper into this, okay? So note that in females, it's an arousal model predominantly, which is why in treatment, almost always, I find myself needing to prescribe a mood stabilizer as a buffer before considering a stimulant, or not necessarily always before, but as a buffer um, to control that arousal. Now this could be mood stabilizer or it could be, we'll see tomorrow, alpha-2 presynaptic agonist to reduce hyperarousal. But that almost always gives a much better combination than if we simply go down the path of a um, activating agent. So just keep that in mind. I'm not saying in all cases. Some cases a single stimulant will work, particularly the milder end of the spectrum. I'm talking about individuals when they present to you with significant anxiety, significant arousal symptoms. You'll find this particular picture. And interestingly, lamotrigine is evidence-based in comorbid mood disorder and ADHD. We know that these agents through glutamatergic NMDA antagonism, reduction of glutamate, excessive glutamate can improve cognition as well. All right. Okay. So with this foundation, what we'll be able to do when we come to the specific diagnostic hierarchy, and then we'll be going through the cases, we'll be able to connect all of this and it's fascinating how these patterns repeat. So Rima asked about anger, a really great question. If we think about anger discontrol, really it's that top-down inhibition and that's the best way of sort of thinking about it. We are looking at activation of that mesolimbic or salience pathway responsible for anger discontrol. And there are two ways usually of addressing anger discontrol. One is we can target this 
salience pathway directly, and we know for mesolimbic uh, targeting, we have uh, the lower end, we have things like benzodiazepine short term, we have clonidine. You know, clonidine is an ASD, behavioral aggression, it's even in behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, guanfacine is there. So we know that by targeting the adrenergic system, the noradrenergic pathway, antagonizing it, redu reducing hyperarousal, we can target anger. Then we have mood stabilizers, right? So we have topiramate, for example, for impulse control, valproate. And then as it goes higher up, if anger is associated with agitation, then often we need dopamine antagonism. But the other way of actually enhancing or reducing this arousal phenomenon is by strengthening this prefrontal cortex. And we don't have to use stimulants for that. We can use other medications that are dopaminergic that also provide the same benefit. But there is a dopaminergic hierarchy that allows us to do that. And we can decide based on the amount or the level um, how much we actually need. So when we think about, say, anger discontrol or even bipolar disorder, when we look at bipolar depression, right at the bottom, when we look at level four, we have armodafinil, right? We have primipexol. So dopamin dopaminergic agents are evidence-based. We know that. So essentially, when it's prescribed with a buffer, the risk of having that switch, etc., it goes down. And that's what we're going to, to look at, is how do we target this based on symptoms when we look at the cases? Because one of the cases we're doing is, you know, very similar to what you asked. And Isaac, you know, absolutely, I think anger can be often misunderstood in women with undiagnosed, spot on. Because of that emotional arousal model, you see anxiety, internalized symptoms, you see anger discontrol, which is why often a borderline uh, diagnosis can be, can be present. Doesn't mean that they don't have those traits, most certainly, but we can still address it because sometimes I find that, oh, they've got borderline personality, so medication doesn't work, uh, which is not necessarily true. Um, to that end, I've seen significant turnaround, emotional symptoms, spot on, exactly. Yes, extremely out of the blue when that happened, but the person in question suddenly experienced feeling loving them, so we project it, yeah. So absolutely, when prefrontal cortex and reward systems improve, we often find dramatic changes in individuals. But the thing about hormonal, and it's linked to the questions that you're asking, um, is that you know, there are the organizational effects in perinatal development. And what's important here is that, interestingly, testosterone results in what's known as this neural rectorization, which means that one part of the brain develops, the other one lags. Um, particularly the left, which increases the risk of neurodevelopmental disorders for males. Whilst in females, uh, estrogen is protective. But one of the things that can happen in females is that there is the activational effects at pubertal transition. So what you can see here is that in males, the cerebral lateralization through exposure to high levels of testosterone affects dopaminergic systems. Uh, and that's what increases the risk for ADHD in, in males. But estrogen and progesterone also modulate dopaminergic pathways. In fact, are very important in striatum and nucleus accumbens. A pubertal increase in estrogen is known to increase dopamine receptors. Why is it so important? So two things I'd highly recommend to look out for in the diagnostic evaluation. One, PMDD. You see an exaggerated PMDD type picture in women with an ADHD phenotype. And two, if you ever have uh, females around the perimenopausal period that present with new onset diagnosis like new onset you know, late onset borderline. I guess what I'm trying to highlight is where mood arousal symptoms are really heightened, where impulse control is really heightened, or even reactivation of trauma. Uh, keep an eye out for this particular phenotype. Why? Because we know that estrogen drops in that perimenopausal menopausal period, and when estrogen drops, dopaminergic aspects can be affected significantly, which means prefrontal cortex inhibition of this part of the brain is basically taken away. Limbic system can really start firing. And so look out for this part, cognitive activity, those specific symptoms, and you may get a much better outcome by, by focusing on that particular area as well. All right, so if, as I mentioned, a female protective effect is present because of estrogen. Now, some of these slides I'm over-inclusive because these are recorded, so you can you know, view them in your own time, but all of this is there. Uh, on the articles as well, all right? Okay, so I mentioned about PMDD, and what's interesting here is that how to dose certain medications. Sometimes dose adjustments may be needed. One of the interesting things is progesterone can stimulate dopamine release only if there's been a pre-exposure to estrogen. 
which could be associated with the observed improvement in sensory motor functions during phases of the menstrual cycle when progesterone is elevated. So therefore, generally, one of the things you want to look at during the cycle is that nature from a premenstrual perspective. What's it like? Uh, is control adequate or is more control sort of needed? And estrogen increases dopamine release in the striatum by reducing GABA tone. So estrogen and progesterone, the way I think about it, are necessary for prefrontal cortex and striatal functioning due to dopamine. So when we think about the menstrual cycle, uh, this is the you know, PMDD sort of picture, but note that we are seeing a drop in estrogen and progesterone sort of around this particular, you know, after this, right? So this is where I am uh, really looking at whether there is a significant worsening or not. So look out for estrogen progesterone uh, and the decrease that occurs could result in excessive prefrontal cortex uh, being sort of shut out and the arousal areas increasing.